Thank you for the conference board for inviting me and in the following 14 minutes we're trying to answer few questions about pre-diabetes. Well, here is a story of Yasser. Yasser is not one of my patients. He is a friend of mine. Yasser is 48 years, smoker, having positive family history of type 2, hypertensive, dyslipidemic, BMI is 31, he's obese, and he's physically inactive. One day, Yasser called me that he checked his blood glucose and his fasting blood glucose is 114, the positive brandy is 165 with A1C with 5.9. And he's asking, is he diabetic with this range or not? Well, what, I have, what I've said to Yasser that he is in this range, he is in this gray zone between the threshold of normal glycemia and the threshold of the diagnosis of type 2 diabetes, you are pre-diabetic. Yes, sir. And here the questions started from the side of yes, sir. Yes, sir asked me four difficult questions. The first question is what, the second is why, the third is how, and the last is who. Let me start by the first question of yes, sir, which is why. Yes, sir is asking, why have I got this condition of pre-diabetes? Well, yes, sir is actually having all the risk factors that can lead to pre-diabetes, namely obesity. We all know that abdominal obesity with such a high level of free fatty acids and the depokines leads to insulin resistance. Yes, there is dyslipidemic. And emerging data is that the position of triglycerides in the liver and muscle can lead to insulin resistance. Not only that, but the position in the pancreas can lead to beta cell dysfunction as well. Yes, there is hypertensive and the hypertension is no more an association with pre-diabetes, but can be an etiological factor. Likely due to overactivity of renin angiotensin system. RAS overactivity lead to insulin resistance and might be involved in beta cell dysfunction as well. Yes, there is having a family history of diabetes and having a family history of type 2 diabetes increases the risk of pre-diabetes at least by 70 percent. Genes here are due to insulin resistance and beta cell dysfunction as well. Physical inactivity is an independent risk factor of pre-diabetes. Lastly but not at least smoking. Smoking is a risk factor of pre-diabetes due to the inflammatory state associated with smoking which leads to insulin resistance. So this is the first question of Yasser. Why have we got prediabetes? Well, you have all the risk factors that can lead to prediabetes. So I'm not surprised to find you having a prediabetic range today. The second question is, is what? What are the consequences or complications of this condition? This is an important question given that pre-diabetes is a very common condition and here is the data in the year 17 in our region, the MENA region, about 35 million the diagnosed pre-diabetics expected to double by the year 45. So it's a very relevant question. What are the consequences or complications that can occur with pre-diabetes? We all know that the natural history for pre-diabetics that they will develop type 2 diabetes by time. So we all from many years that pre-diabetes will progress to type 2 diabetes and everyone here is aware that type 2 diabetes is associated with both microvascular complications 
neuropathy, chronic kidney disease, retinopathy, and macrovascular disease, coronary peripheral arterial disease, and stroke. Yet, there is a cumulative evidence over the recent years that prediabetes without evolving to type 2 diabetes is associated with vascular complications. Yes, prediabetes per se can lead to vascular diabetic complications, both microvascular complications, for example here, up to 25% of individuals with prediabetes do have an evidence of peripheral neuropathy. Formerly, we used to say it idiopathic neuropathy, a big part of this idiopathic neuropathy ended up to be due to prediabetes. Not only somatic neuropathy, but autonomic neuropathy as well. Many patients with unexplained resting tachycardia or erectile dysfunction, prediabetes can explain that. The other microvascular disease, retinopathy, and look at that. The U.S. Diabetes Prevention Program, approximately 8% of prediabetics had an evidence of retinopathy. This is consistent with data from Germany, around 80% again of prediabetics do have an evidence of retinopathy. Lastly, in the microvascular disease, diabetic kidney disease, the pathology of diabetic nephropathy starts during the prediabetic state. And the prediabetes per se is an independent risk factor for the development of albuminuria. So prediabetes could be associated with microvascular disease. What about macrovascular disease? It's not actually much better. The evidence is clear that prediabetes increased the risk of cardiovascular disease by around 20% as per this meta-analysis. And data from Paris Prospective study that prediabetes was associated with double the risk of cardiovascular mortality. So, so prediabetes is not that an innocent condition. It is not that, well, keep healthy, keep your weight less, not to get type 2 diabetes. No, prediabetes is a condition that can lead to vascular complications and here is the next the second question is what could be the consequences of prediabetes the third question or question of yasser how to treat what can i do how to how to manage prediabetes well the mainstay here is lifestyle intervention lifestyle intervention actually is very effective and we have a solid evidence to support that the U.S. Diabetes Prevention Program, just by very simple methodology, losing 7% of weight or more, half an hour of brisk walking per day and decreasing saturated fat could reduce the progression to type 2 diabetes by 58%. This was consistent with data from Ducking study in China and Diabetes Prevention study from Finland. Lifestyle intervention works to prevent the development of type 2 diabetes. What about drugs? Any use for pharmacotherapy in this regards in ESR in people with prediabetes, metformin in this regards should come first. Metformin is recommended by several guidelines for the prevention of type 2 diabetes. In the U.S. Diabetes Prevention Program, metformin could reduce the incidence of diabetes by 31%. So metformin is approved for that. Any other drugs? Well, quickly I'll pass by some trials. Data on bioglitazone. Bioglitazone could reduce the development of type 2 diabetes around 70%. However, this can be associated with side effects, as you know, of increasing weight and edema. Acarbose 
it's not only decreasing absorption of glucose but modifying the gut microbiota and in the stop needing study acarpos use was associated with 25 percent decreasing risk of development of type 2 however again the GIT tolerance of acarbose can lead to discontinuation. GLP-1 receptor agonists have done very well in this regard, with figure reaching more than 80% in terms of decreasing the incidence of diabetes in pre-diabetics. And here you can see the term of regression to euglycemia. Lastly, but not at least, SGLT2 inhibitors, glyphlosins. In pool analysis of patients recruited in DAPA CKD and DAPA heart failure have shown 33% reduction of incidence of new cases of type 2 diabetes in people receiving glyphlosins in this study. So we have several pharmacological agents together with life to answer the question of how to treat, what should be done. ADA this year, to summarize, proved and confirmed that first line should be intensive lifestyle therapy, aiming at reduction of weight at least 7%, with brisk walking half an hour per day. Metformin should, should be considered if the A1C is 6 or more, for this with PMI exceeding 35 and with ladies with history of gestational diabetes, not to forget to correct cardiovascular risk factors like hypertension and dyslipidemia. So this is this question of how we treat pre-diabetes. The last question is who? Or in other words, whom should be screened to detect pre-diabetes? Should we test it for everyone? No. Again, back to the ADA for this year. We should screen everybody above the age of 35 for the pre for this detection of prediabetes. And we should screen everyone, regardless of the age, who is having BMI of more than 25 and one or more of these risk factors. First degree relative with type 2, hypertension, dyslipidemia, physical inactivity, polycystic ovary, and features of insulin resistance like acanthosis, negricans. These are the criteria to answer the question of whom should be screened for prediabetes. Mr. Chairman, dear colleagues, to conclude. Pre-diabetes is such a gray zone transition between normal glucose tolerance and type 2 diabetes. Yet, we have effective intervention that we can do in this stage. Pre-diabetes is not an innocent condition. This can be associated with both microvascular and macrovascular complications. So, interventions need to be started as early as possible. And bottom line, that lifestyle intervention remains the main player here. Thank you very much. For